Good morning. It's good to see you here today. Um, welcome to worship with us here at First Baptist Church. Out of habit, I almost welcomed our online crowd and our radio crowd, but our internet's out. And so I have to call Pathway tomorrow about that. So if anybody calls you or texts you or sees you and asks you about our service and why it wasn't on KCLW or on the internet, you let them know our internet was out and that we're getting that worked on uh, first thing this week. We've got a few reminders today. First off, we are going to have a special prayer time during this service for those who are going to Camp Eagle, both students and chaperones, as well as those who are going on the Montana trip, uh, mission trip. So tomorrow morning, uh, our junior high, our senior high students will leave. They need to be here at 9 a.m. Is that correct, Peter? Be here at 9 a.m., bright and early. Um, <clears throat> and then on Thursday, the junior high students will leave. They also need to be here at 9 a.m. on Thursday morning. Is that correct? Bright and early at 9 a.m. So you want them here by 9 or y'all going to leave at 9? Okay, be here at 9. Be here at 9. Fantastic. Um, and then uh, we've got various people going up at various different times to Montana. So we've got some leaving Wednesday and driving. We've got some flying up on Friday, and we've got some flying up on Monday. So if you would just keep us as well as our uh, Camp Eaglers in your prayers. Backyard Kids Club is what we're doing this year in lieu of Vacation Bible School. And uh, that's going to be Monday, August 8th through Wednesday, August 10th. It's going to be in the evenings. There, is a, there are two what they call QR codes in the bulletin. Uh, so if you know of any kids in your neighborhood or close to you or related to you who might be interested in participating in Backyard Kids Club, which again is much like Vacation Bible School, uh, their parents can take their, their smartphone and just scan this one here that says student, and that'll take them straight to the website where they can register their child for Backyard Kids Club. If, you want to, if you're planning to help out with Backyard Kids Club and volunteer to help with that, you can take a smartphone and scan this one on the right-hand side and fill that out. Otherwise, you can contact the church office uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. and let us know that you intend to help. Um, deacon selection will be coming up in August. You will receive, if you're a church, every church member will receive a, a letter at home explaining that process and how that works here at First Baptist Church. Those nominations will take place during a two-week window in August from the 7th through the 21st. Um, <laughs> I mentioned last week, and I want to mention again because sometimes we just need to hear it a couple of times. Um, someone brought a jigsaw up here for uh, during the Easter pageant back in April when we got ready to pack up and, and take everything home. He wasn't able to find the jigsaw. So if you see a jigsaw somewhere here, or if you've accidentally put someone else's jigsaw in your tool uh, pile, uh, let me know, and we want to make sure that jigsaw gets back to its proper owner. Uh, two weeks from today is a fifth Sunday. Just go ahead and get that in your mind. July 31st, fifth Sunday potluck over here in the Youth and Family Life Center. And then a couple of things that, that per my fault, did not make it into the bulletin, first of all, that next Sunday is our regular quarterly business meeting, fourth Sunday in July, a regular standard quarterly business meeting uh, next Sunday, July 24th. And finally, and finally, this is also not in the bulletin, but immediately following the service, well, A, those that know we're having a Montana, if you're going to Montana with us, you know we're meeting, but, but immediately following this service, we need, we need two or three pickup trucks, and, and as many people as willing to help, we'll make quick work of it. We need to transfer some tables and chairs that are back here in Karkalitz Hall back over to the Youth and Family Life Center. Folks, this won't take long at all. I had a few young men uh, helping uh, uh, Friday morning. Uh, do this didn't take us long at all. I don't. It, it's not going to take long. If we can get we can get all the tables and chairs in the back of two, maybe three pickup trucks, pull them back over and put them back in the Youth and Family Life Center. So immediately following the service today, if you can help us do that, please do that. At this time, would you please bow with me for prayer? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your love and for your presence with us always. We know that you are here 
in this place, among us, among the, the gathering of believers, in each heart, Lord, but also present among us. And so, Lord, we take time now to acknowledge your presence and to say, Lord, this is for you. Uh, we come in with all sorts of things on our hearts and our minds and, and, and so many things to preoccupy us. But, Lord, right now we lay all of those burdens down. We lay them down at the feet of Jesus. And, Lord, we say we trust you and we love you. And we want to offer to you today a sacrifice of unfettered worship and praise. Lord, that your name might be glorified and magnified among us. And so, Lord, now we pray that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts will be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. I pray this in and through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. As it was mentioned, uh, we are having some Wi-Fi issues right now, so with our live stream. Uh, hopefully we're actually going to be able to post this on YouTube later, and if so, thank you for joining us uh, much later for this service. Uh, we're really thankful that you uh, take the time uh, to look at this service as well. And if you are with us this morning, uh, we're going to turn to hymn number 64, All Creatures of Our God and King. We're going to sing first one, two, and five of the hymn, from the hymnal. If you want to grab your hymnal, it says hymn number 64. The words will be on the screen as it normally is, um, and if you're following us on YouTube, uh, we're to be on the top left corner of your screen.
Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this time of being able to come together and worship you. We thank you for the privilege of being able to give to you um, our tithes and offerings this week. Lord, we ask that you bless this, um, these contributions um, to further serve your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen.
So if you would, turn in your Bibles, not to Luke 17, but to Luke 19. I'll take the blame for that one as well. Luke 19 is where we are today. Uh, we also have Children's Church, so if you're age kindergarten and younger, uh, you can make your way back here, Miss Allison, as well as Brand, as well as Maddox, it looks like, are going to be helping with Children's Church today. That ought to be fun. Can I go to Children's Church? Y'all can just read what I got here. Okay, I guess not. Luke 19, uh, which will be our last sermon from Luke's Gospel. Uh, next week, I'll do a, a planning on doing a, a kind of an encouraging, uplifting, upbeat type sermon, uh, especially in light of those that have been so faithful through the, the summer slump. Uh, we always, you know, summer attendance is always like this and often more like this than like this. Uh, so just to want to encourage you next week. But this week, our, our last uh, sermon, when we started, we started with Jesus' birth and, and then his, his agenda that he lays out in Luke 4. Uh, we went all the way through, and we had to come to a stopping place before Palm Sunday, and we looked at the royal entry, which is actually right after this in Luke 19, and then we looked at his crucifixion and, and resurrection in Luke's gospel, and then we went back and picked up some of the things that we missed along the way, and now we find ourselves um, almost to Jerusalem once again. So we've, we've caught back up to that place where we stopped the first time. And um, I think it's a very fit, fitting parable to end our course of sermons through Luke, God, Luke's gospel on. Uh, I told Matt, you know, the parable of the ten minas, Probably nobody knows what a mina is anyway, but, but that's what the name of this parable is. And I think it's a very fitting parable in light of the fact that we are sending forth uh, campers and chaperones to Camp Eagle. And uh, we are sending forth uh, adults and young people to Montana on a mission, mission endeavor. Uh, and, and so as we sang today the servant song followed by that chorus, find us. Faithful, which was a standard under Brad Davis's ministry here. Uh, that is our hope, that we would be found faithful, that we would be servants, that we would go forth as servants of the Lord, and at the end of the day, that we would be found faithful. Friday morning, as I, as I was here and I was watching uh, Colin Melton mow the lawn out here, I, I had a moment of nostalgia. And I, I turned to Whichever pollster boy was standing there at the time, I forget, the younger of the two. Is that Joe? Okay, Joe Polster. And I says, man, I miss cutting grass. He said, you don't cut grass, and not unless it rains. And so since it doesn't rain, I don't cut grass. But I said, I actually did professional lawn care for five years. He said, really? I says, yeah. My dad and I, we did professional lawn care. See, Daddy retired at 42. I'm 42. Wouldn't that be great? But no, he got a full disability retirement, so after he retired, he and I went into lawn care business together. I didn't realize what a sweet deal I had. We split the money 50-50, and all the equipment and gas and maintenance came out of his 50. <laughs> so I had a pretty sweet deal. And, and, but, but we did. We, we, we did that for five summers, spring, summer, fall, you know, until grass cutting season was over. And, and, and I learned a lot during that time, working with my dad, doing manual labor, doing yard work, keeping up people's lawns. And, and, and for, one of the, one, for instance, one of the things I learned how to do was back a trailer. Now, if you can learn how to back a single axle, eight-foot trailer on a stick shift when you're 12 years old. See, Daddy couldn't back a trailer, so I had to learn how. I didn't have a choice. He drove 18-wheeler for a while, still couldn't back a trailer. He got so embarrassed, he pulled in a truck stop, tried to make sure he'd be able to pull through, but every now and then, somebody'd park in front of him, have to go back in the truck stop and get one of the other truck drivers to back his rig out. That's how bad he was at backing a trailer. So at the age of 12, I had to learn how to back a trailer. That's one of the lessons that I learned. Uh, and, and many of the lessons I've learned, I have forgotten that's where I learned them. And they don't really stand out anymore because I've just assimilated, assimilated those lessons into my life. But one lesson in particular stands out. I remember where I was, when it was, exactly what we were doing when he spoke the words, Son, when somebody loans you something, you always take it back to him in better shape than it was when you got it. See, our mower was in the shop. Uh, Sears was working on it, and so 
we borrowed a mower from Mr. Tom Butler, who also, he and his boys also did lawn care. They're the ones who got us into it. And so we borrowed Mr. Tom's mower. Now, now Mr. Tom's mower was not just filthy when we got it. It wasn't just filthy, but it wasn't exactly like it was spit shined either. It was just kind of average for a lawnmower, we'll say. So after we got through cutting the yards that day with Mr. Tom's mower, my dad pulled into the Clarkdale Superette, which had a car wash, one of those with the pressure washers. And I says, Dad, what are, what are we doing here? He said, we're going to wash Mr. Tom's mower. And I said, why? It wasn't real clean when we got it. And that's when Dad said, son, when someone loans you something, you always return it in better shape than when you got it. That's where I was. That's what I was doing. And that memory will forever be etched in my mind. One of the greatest lessons I think we could learn, maybe not the greatest lessons, but certainly an important lesson, that, that if somebody loans you something, if somebody gives you something on loan, it's not yours, it's theirs, but they have loaned it to you, and so it's yours to take care of. And, and, and when you give it back to them, don't give it back to them in worse shape. Don't give them back, give it back to them in the same shape. No, you give it back to them in better shape. Now one time we borrowed his mower and dad forgot to pull the pin on the trailer that did this and so the mower came off the trailer and went Bloop, and we dented the back of the mower and that wasn't his fault. It just happened. But, but nine times out of ten he always made sure to do that. That was an accident. Take it back in better shape than when you got it. In Luke 19, Jesus tells this story, this story of the ten minas, um, the ten servants. Each gave them one mina each, and we'll talk about that. But, but this story has really a lot of different applications and, and multiple levels of meaning. But, but I think one of the primary lessons of this story, this parable, is, is that when God gives you something on loan, then when the time comes for you to present that back to God, that, that we should give it back to God in better shape than it was when God gave it to us. That, that when God gives us something, a gift, when God gives it to us, it's not really ours, it's still His. But, but He lets us have it, He lets us use it for as long as we're on this earth. And, and when we stand before Him and, and say, Lord, here, here you go, when we give an account of what we've done with his gifts. We want to be able to present that back to God in better shape even than when he first gave it to us. Beginning in Luke 19, 11, we're simply going to walk through this passage of Scripture together. Some of you will notice that, that this parable is very, very similar to Matthew's parable of the talents. But it's not exactly the same. Some scholars think it's the same parable told two different ways, but many believe it's actually a different, different story altogether. It's just that the parable of the talents is one story, and the parable of the ten minas is, is a different story. And we find it only in Luke's gospel, beginning in verse 11. Look with me here. Jesus says, while they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was, he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. So we need some context. It says, while they were listening to this, this what? Well, Jesus has been in the home of Zacchaeus. And Jesus has just gotten through telling them that the Son of Man, referring to himself, came to seek and to save the lost. And, and, and he still got on the floor. They're still listening. And Jesus keeps talking. He's still at Zacchaeus' house. That's roughly 18 miles from Jerusalem. And from there, it will take them roughly six hours on foot to reach Jerusalem. Since chapter 9, he's been on his way to Jerusalem. He has set his face resolutely towards Jerusalem. Every step he's taken since chapter 9, verse 54, has been a step towards Jerusalem. And now he's, he's literally six hours' journey from Jerusalem. And if you look ahead to verse 28 which is down a little further. It's right after this parable. And it says, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. So this is the very last thing 
that Jesus says to his followers before he, he makes his royal entry into the city of Jerusalem. Now, Jesus knows that, that his followers still have some, some misconceptions. Even, even after all this time and all this teaching, his followers still have some, some misconceptions about the nature of the kingdom of God. And, and they've, still, they've still got this idea, some of them in their minds, that Jesus has come to set up an earthly kingdom. They still think this. And so since they think that Jesus has come, up, come to set up an earthly kingdom, they also have some misconceptions about what Jesus is expecting them to do next. So that if you don't understand that Jesus didn't come, up to, come to set up an earthly kingdom, then you don't really understand what you're supposed to do next because you don't know what's going to happen next. So Jesus tells this story. And this, is, this story is the way Jesus clears up the misconceptions they have. And those who get it will get it. Kind of like the if you know, you know thing. If they get it, if they understand that Jesus has not set up, come to set up an earthly kingdom, then they're going to understand what he expects them to do next. Look at verse 12. This is the beginning of the story Jesus tells here to clear up these misconceptions about the nature of his kingdom and what he came to do. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So in this parable, the man of noble birth represents Jesus himself. Jesus is going to be crucified. He's going to enter Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem, he's going to experience rejection, and he's going to be crucified, and he's going to die, and then he's going to be raised by the power of God, and then Jesus is going to ascend into heaven, back to the right hand of the Father, and at some point in the future, Jesus is going to return. So the man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king, and then to return. He said, isn't Jesus already king? Sure he is. Sure he is. But, but it's not until Jesus returns in all his glory that his, his kingship, his lordship over all will be revealed to all. And his full authority as king of all kings will be absolute. So this, this is where Jesus clears up the misconception that he is not on the way to Jerusalem to set up an earthly kingdom. He just clears that right up. He's not. He's going away. He's going away. He's going to a distant country. He's going to be with the Father. And only when he returns will he exercise his full authority as king. Now looking in verse 13. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Put this money to work. Literally, go do business with this money. He said, until I come back. So in this story, the man of noble birth, the one that represents Jesus, he, he calls before he leaves to go to this distant country where he'll be appointed king. He calls in ten servants. He gives each servant an amount of money that's worth about four months' wages. So whatever you make in four months, that's, that's how much Jesus gave each one of these servants. And what does he tell these servants to do with that money? He says, put it to work. Do business with it. Um, for how long? He doesn't specify a length of time, does he? He simply says, until I come back. You do this and you keep doing this. Very simple and straightforward. You take this money, you take my money, and you go out and you do business and you turn a profit. And you do that and you just keep on doing that until I Come back, whatever that may be. So in a roundabout way, this is where Jesus clears up any misconceptions his followers have about what he wants them to do between the time he ascends to the Father and the time he returns. Jesus wants, to, wants us to take what he has given us, whatever that is, and use it for his benefit, for his glory, to further his agenda, to accomplish his purposes here on the earth. Looking now at verse 14, the next verse, it says, But his subjects 
Okay, subjects is the word citizens. It's different than the word servants. But his subjects or citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. Again, the contrast. Verse 13, he gives the money to the servants. In verse 14, these are subjects or citizens. It's a different group of people. Servants in 13, citizens in 14. And so who do these subjects, these citizens in this parable represent? Well, they represent the, the Jewish leaders and the, really the Jewish nation as a whole. As a whole, not now... Not every Jew rejected Jesus. All of his followers at this point are Jewish. But as a whole, as a whole, the nation rejects him. What does he, what does he experience once he enters Jerusalem? Rejection, rejection, rejection. Once he reaches Jerusalem, it's one rejection after another until he's finally crucified with a sign above his head that says, Jesus of Nazareth, King of of the Jews. Oh no, 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 no. The Jewish leaders go to Pilate and they say, no, do not say that this man is the king of the Jews, but that he claimed to be the king of the Jews. They, they reject him as their king. He enters Jerusalem as their king, the royal entry, and yet they reject him. So Jesus experiences this rejection firsthand. Again, it's not every Jew. His first followers are Jewish. There's no room for anti-Semitism here. But, but as a whole, the nation, the Jewish people reject him. And, and that's what Jesus is referring here to in verse 14. The Jewish leaders and the Jewish nation as a whole rejecting his authority as rightful king. Look at verse 15. He was made king, however, and returned home. So despite their rejection of him... He was made king anyway, and he came back. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. So Jesus, or rather the, 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 the king here, the noble man of noble birth who represents Jesus, when he comes back, Jesus has all authority. And when he comes back, Jesus exercises that authority to its fullest Extent The king here says, what have you done with my money? What have you done with it? How have you used the things that I gave you on loan to benefit me? How have you used those things to, to further my agenda? How have you used those things to expand the borders and the influence of my kingdom? And the application here is, is really very simple. If we think about it, every positive attribute, every positive quality, every gift, talent, and ability that we have is a gift from God. It's a gift from God. It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. We are not the owners of those positive qualities or attributes. We're not the owners of those gifts, talents, and abilities. We are the stewards, the managers. Those things are ours own loan from God, that smile, that charm, that work ethic, that athletic ability, that musical talent, that personality, that, that commitment or devotion, that focus, that determination, that drive, that empathy, that ability to make money, that, that ability to work with your hands and craft things, that brilliant mind you have, that ability to win friends and influence people. Whatever we have, whatever positive qualities and attributes we possess, they're ours own loan. Own loan from God. We wouldn't have those things except, except that God gave those to us as a good gift to be used for His glory, to further His agenda, to accomplish His purposes, to expand the influence of His reign and His rule. Now, I also feel compelled to say this. It's a little tangential, but I think it's important because I, I see it happening sometimes. When it comes to doing things for the Lord and when it comes to, to, to doing things to further the Christian agenda, some people mistakenly believe that the end justifies the means. And some people think that, that it, if we are working toward a Christian end, 
then it really doesn't matter what kind of means we use to achieve that end. But that's not right. That's not right. It's important to have the right ends, to be working towards Christian goals, Christian purposes, Christian ends, but it is just as important to employ Christian means to achieve those ends. To employ unchristian means to achieve Christian ends really does nothing to glorify Christ. Quite the contrary, it's defamation of character against Jesus. Because to do something in the name of Christ that is unchristian doesn't bring glory. It's defamation. So moving right along to verses 16 through 19. The first one, the servants that he called in, the first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. So he took, ten, he took a mina, four months wages, and, 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 and multiplied it a thousand percent. Well done, my good servant, his master replied, because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. I'll be honest and say there are parts of this that I've never known 100% what to do with. That's okay. I don't ever mind saying I don't know. But I understand the big picture, and I think that's enough. Both of these servants turn a profit for their master. They take the master's money and they turn a profit with it. And because of that, they get a reward. And I want you to notice the reward they receive has to do with continued service. More service. They had served their master faithfully. They were found faithful as, as stewards. They had been found faithful with what he gave them. And so now he gives them even more. Again, not to own but to steward, to manage. So the reward for faithful service here is the opportunity for even greater levels of service. And the other thing I want you to notice here is the definition of faithful service. Faithful service is doing something with what God loans us. Faithful service is doing something with what God loans us. These two servants multiplied their master's money. The first one multiplied it thousand percent the second one multiplied it 500 percent I don't think it matters the percentages and how much the point here is that they did something with it they didn't just get all they say get all you can can all you get and sit on your can they didn't do that they they took the master's money and they went out and they did something with it and again it doesn't have to be money the gifts talents and abilities the qualities and characteristics that we have. Remember what my dad said. When someone loans you something. When it's time to give it back to them. Make sure you give it back to them better. Than it was when you got it. That's the lesson here. Whatever we have. Whatever positive qualities and attributes we possess. God has given those to us. Not to own but to steward. They're ours on loan. And, and so our responsibility with those is threefold. Number one, embrace those gifts. Embrace those gifts. For the longest time, my in-laws had a, a painting that my wife did when she was a little girl. I don't know what age. It was quite clearly done by a little girl. It was a painting of a duck. You could tell it was a duck. And on that painting were also written the words, If God made you a duck, then be a duck. Swim fast and strong and don't get bent out of shape if you waddle when you run. <laughs> Whatever gifts God has given you, don't be ashamed of them. Don't be shy about them. Don't be boastful and braggadocious, but don't be shy to embrace those gifts as good gifts from God to be used for His glory. Number two, educate those gifts. Embrace them and educate them. And, and by that I mean don't, don't be content to simply have them as they are. You do what you can to, to educate, to train, to better, to improve, to hone and refine 
those gifts. I'm going to take the example of musical ability because I think that's one of the most salient and, and readily available examples here. Some people are naturally gifted musicians. And, and, and they're good at it. They can sit down and play anything. Or they, can, they can sing anything or whatever. But, but you take that natural aptitude, that natural talent they have, and, and, and you do some training and you do some education with that person, and they're even better. They're even better musicians. You can apply that to any gift. You have a great smile, practice it, improve it. You know, you're not here today, but Mr. Jesse's always saying, keep smiling, boy, it looks good on you. <laughs> always. You work on that. You got a strong work ethic, great. Pair that with a skill. Pair that with a skill. I don't have any skills. I used to have a good work ethic, but I don't have any skills. So I can't do anything with a work ethic if I don't know any skills. Whatever gifts, talents, and abilities God has given you, whatever it is, don't let them remain as they are. Train them, educate them, hone them, refine them, make them even better than when you receive them. And finally, don't just embrace them, don't just educate them, but exercise them. Exercise those gifts. We have been given those gifts for a reason. God expects us to do something with them, use them for His glory. When we leave this earth or when Christ returns and God asks, what about those gifts I gave you? We ought to be able to say, Lord, here, you gift, here are your gifts, the ones that you gave me on loan. Here they are. And, and I, Lord, I worked hard with them, and I worked hard on them. I, I did my best to improve upon them and refine them and hone them. And then I put them to work for you, Lord. And, Lord, here, here are the gifts you gave me, along with the return on your investment. All for the glory of your name. And I don't know exactly what God plans to say or give us when we do that, but I want to hear it, and I want to receive it. I want to hear, well done, my good servant. And whether it's five cities, ten cities, or no cities at all, whatever reward we get, that's what I want. So let's move on in the story, and let's see what happens with this third servant. That's two, three, there's seven more. But if Jesus told all ten, that would take forever. So we've got just one more servant. Verses 20 through 26. Then another servant came and said, Sir, sir, here is your mina. I have, laid, I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you were a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words. You wicked servant, you knew, did you, that I am a hard man taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. Sir, they said he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. And it will be very clear that the picture here is a person who might be on the king's payroll, but he doesn't know the king. It's a person who, who has an association with the king, but he does not have a personal relationship with the king. And in the end, this person receives only judgment from the king, not because of what he did or did not do, but because he didn't know the king. If he had known the king, he would have done what was right. Again, we're not talking about someone who is saved, someone who has a personal relationship with Jesus. We're talking about a poser, someone who's on the roll, but doesn't have a firsthand personal relationship with Christ. For that person, there can only be judgment from God, not because of anything they have or have not done, but because they don't know King Jesus. And finally, there's verse 27. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Jesus is not usually this violent. But as he tells this story, the story follows the reality of politics in the ancient world. Because if you refuse to recognize a king's authority, what happens? That's the end of you. 
You pay with your life. And in the same way, the penalty for rejecting Jesus is facing the judgment of God. Jesus will soon enter the city of Jerusalem and they will reject him as king. Jerusalem will utterly reject Jesus. And in the short term, the city of Jerusalem faces the judgment of God. Jerusalem is destroyed in the year A.D. 70. In the long term, there's a more permanent judgment for those who reject Jesus, for those who knowingly and wittingly refuse to accept Jesus as Lord and King and Savior. God's judgment is simply this. They will receive exactly what their sins have earned. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Wages are something that you earn. And so we all deserve, because of our sins, eternal separation from God. That is what our sin earns us. And eternal separation from God is the very epitome of death. An eternity completely devoid of God and God's presence, that's death. And that's what each of us deserve. That's what our sins have earned us, the wages of sin is death. But that same verse goes on to say, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. See, no one has to suffer eternal separation from God. God makes salvation available to all at no cost to the recipient. Jesus paid the price for it. He paid for it on the, on the cross. He suffered and he bled and he died. He suffered a death he did not deserve so that we could have a life we don't deserve. We can have forgiveness, salvation, eternal life by putting our faith in Christ as Savior and Lord. And if that is something you're ready to do today, if you're ready to receive God's gift of eternal life, of forgiveness and salvation and eternal life, then during this next song, I'll be here at the front to talk with you and pray with you about it. Maybe you already know King Jesus, and, and you know that you know King Jesus. And if that's the case, then here's what I'd like for you to do. If you've not already done it, I'd, I'd like for you to make a commitment, a dedication. Whatever God has given you, whatever positive qualities and attributes you possess, I would like for you to make a commitment to embrace and to educate and to exercise those gifts for the glory of God. Finally, if you're ready to become a member of this church family, of First Baptist Church, we would love to have you, and we'd love to talk with you and pray with you about it. And I'll be here at the front to receive you as Matt and Christy come, and Peter to come and lead us in Jesus paid it all. Please stand.
thank you again for being here today. I want to remind you, we do need some help moving back the tables and chairs. So I think I need three pickup trucks and uh, as many uh, folks as willing to help, we'll get this knocked out real quick. Uh, Mr. David Courtney is going to come and lead us in our prayer of benediction. God bless you. I hope to see you back next Sunday. Let's pray. Let us proceed into the coming week diligently serving our Lord and carrying the good news of his salvation to everyone we meet. As Isaiah the prophet said, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make, na make known his deeds among the peoples. Make them remember that his name is exalted. May we give ourselves unselfishly to you, Father, in all that we do and return to this place again next week. Amen. <laughs>